and welcome back to Unearth the Past, a family history and genealogy podcast presented by me, Dr. Michaela Hume. Um, so joining me today is Kerry Kays. If I start to list all of this man's achievements, let me tell you folks, there will be no time for the rest of this podcast. In a career spanning decades, Kerry Kays has reached the very pinnacle of every industry he's ever been involved with. In his younger days, he was a British champion bodybuilder, which led him to opening the world-famous Better Bodies Gym in Manchester. Kerry then used all of his sporting expertise and experience to found the hugely successful sports nutrition company, CNP Professional, a brand that is now recognised all across the world on every sporting platform, from boxing to cycling to football, you name it. In between all this, He has also managed to offer his knowledge and support as a world-class strength and conditioning coach, along with being a nutritional expert to some of the world's best boxers. From world champions such as Ricky Hatton to Tony Bellew, Kerry was the go-to guy for athletes at the very peak of their sports. And if that wasn't enough, I know, as if there could be more, as if that wasn't enough, he now takes a more hands-on approach um, as a much in-demand cut man for an array of superstar professional fighters. Kerry regularly delivers lectures on sports nutrition to audiences from many industries and backgrounds. He has lectured and advised around the world, from, from yacht racing teams to Premier League football teams. Even Ronnie O'Sullivan and the SAFs have benefited from his guidance. So today, uh, it is with enormous pleasure that I welcome Kerry Kays onto my podcast. Thank you very much, Kerry. That's a nice lead in, thank you. Was that a good intro? It was a very good intro, a bit embarrassed to be honest. (laughs) You don't mean a cat like that. I know. But thank you very much. So not many people may know this, or they may, uh, but about, what would you say, about 10 years ago, I looked into your family tree yes you did do you remember yes you did now i remember asking you to do it yes. it was in better bodies uh, uh gymnasium where we, we had a little cafe that was right and, uh, we were sat down i don't know who'd been training gav or uh, brian rose or whoever yeah, yeah. and we just sat down had a cup of tea and uh, i asked you to do it before we go into the family tree how did you get involved then in that world of nutrition and fitness how did that start for you? Well, I was born in 1950 um, and I went to a Roman Catholic school, St. Right. Francis. My mother was a devout Roman Catholic. And you might not know this and other people might not know this, but Catholic schools did not get the same funding as Church of England schools in those days. They really didn't. And... Um, that reflected, I guess, in the education. And Mm. uh, a lot of, a lot of the emphasis on education was religion. Mm. It really was. Mm. And my school, St. Francis was the monastery as well. It was tied onto the church. So, and in those days you left school, depending on how old you was that in the month of the year, you could leave school at 14 in them days. Um, And uh, there was, in the older years, there was one A, B, and C, two A, B, and C, three A, B, and C, and four A, B, and C. And the clever ones went to the A class. And I was in one C, two C, three C. And they didn't even bother with me in four Did C. You know? No, they, I ended up helping the caretaker do all the work. So uh, now I now know, I now know that I'm, I'm, I suffer, well, I don't suffer because it doesn't bother me. I've got terrible dyslexia, right. terrible dyslexia. I can't even read road signs. But in them days, dysle- dyslexia as a label, it, it didn't exist. Mm. You, was, you were a dunce. Mm. So I was a dunce. So I, in them days, again, you left school and it was more labor intensive. There was um, building sites, you know, it, there, was, it, it, there was more work. And um, you either, if you was in the A class, you went and worked in an office. If you was in the B class, you had a choice. If you was in the C class, you worked on a building site. That was the end of it. That was just the end of it. 
And I remember God, and in Denton, where I was, I was in Orton Green, but at Crown Point Denton, they had a youth employment office. And that youth employment office, you could just walk in. And I, this is honest to God, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I walked in and I, I've left school at 14, living in a council house. And uh, she said, I asked, I said, I left school. She said, what would you like to be? And I went, you know, I don't know. So I said, I think I'd like to be a motor mechanic. That's how easy it was. I feel sorry for the kids today. And she said, you don't want to be a motor mechanic. She said, you'd be under the car, under a boot, under a car, greasy, working in the same place for the rest of your life. She went, why don't you be an electrician? And I went, yeah, go on then. And she went, there's a company down the road, Fair Brothers, that have asked me to get my apprentice electrician. And she sent me down and I, I, I had an interview. I'll tell you his name, Tommy Scholes, God rest his soul. And he said to me in the interview, don't forget, I can't read or write, so I've got no qualifications. And he said to me, have you always wanted to be an electrician? And I went, no, I wanted to be a mechanic. You know, that's how stupid it was. And he went, oh, well, he said, it is your lucky day. And he just gave me a job and I became an electrician, just like that. And then, you know, I, I worked on building sites all, all over the country. And that was the start of my career, if you like. So then to get into the fitness world, I worked in Piccadilly here, Piccadilly Gardens. And, the, and it was 7th Avenue Fashions. And it was a new clothes shop from a gentleman from Liverpool. And we were doing all the lights. And there was two electricians. I was 14, stroke 15, maybe. And my job was to clean up, 10 o'clock, go and get butties, 12 o'clock, go to the chip shop. You know, just just a labourer, really. But I was an apprentice electrician. And um, there was a kid called Brian Harrison and Ted Fowler, and they were bodybuilders. Right. And you got to remember, there was, no, there, was, there was only BBC One and ITV. There was no internet. There was no magazines and there was these two bodybuilders. And to be honest, if I probably looked at them today, they probably wouldn't impress me. Right. But at 14 stroke 15, we'd never seen them. I couldn't believe it. They were like supermen. And, and obviously I was asking questions and I was getting the food at 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. And they trained at a gymnasium in Levin Zoom called Sumfit. And they went, come along with us. So I, went, I started going to the gym with them at 14. And that's how I started my career in the fitness industry. That's how it went. Were your parents or were they into fitness, Kerry? Was this completely new? Did it just Nobody start Nobody was you? into fitness. No. Nobody was into fitness. So were they rare they were, they, them two blokes? There was two gyms in Manchester. Yeah. There was the YMCA, mm. which I'm sure you know of, the wrestling. And there was this little shop called Sumfiz. And it was above a cake shop mm. and to my knowledge that was the two gyms in manchester so nobody was into fitness nobody now being into fitness especially at the level you you were it takes dedication what sacrifice you know you you can't be having the same foods that maybe your mates are having because you know you're competing or whatever so all those characteristics that you need like perseverance dedication uh sacrifice were they already were those traits i know like you said you suffered with dyslexia but were those traits already in you then kerry like to keep it going for the and and to achieve what you achieved in that that's a real good question that and you've actually made me do a bit of soul searching because you're right, you've got to be dedicated, disciplined, and most athletes love a routine. Most athletes love a routine. And they talk about when they retire, they, they go to pot, they go I to pieces. It's because they've lost the routine. It's yeah. as simple as that. And if they can keep a routine up in retirement, they'll, mm. they'll do a lot better. But looking back on it now, I remember as, as a kid on a building site, I wanted to... I probably wanted to please, you know, and do a really good job. I wanted to get, if they asked for a certain thing, I wanted to make sure I got it. I wanted to make sure. I remember once, as an apprentice electrician, and don't forget, it's a labour intensive in those days. Mm. I remember, um, and everyone smoked in them days, didn't they? Everyone smoked. And there was an electrician, I can't remember his name, and he was screwing stuff on the wall and and 
because he was up a ladder, I had a box of screws and I had to do that with a screw. So he reached out, picked the screw up, screwed it, and then he put his hand down, I had to do it again. But And I was daydreaming, so I, I just put my hand on the, on the step ladder. I was looking at Summer, and he just stubbed his cigarette out of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> in other words wake up you wake wouldn't get up. away with that now oh, would you well you wouldn't get away with that but I remember so it was like I don't know God taught me a lesson so I wanted to please I wanted to do things I wanted to I'll pick the ladder up I'll carry it I'll, or I'll get up there I'll get up there so yeah I, I think I had a good discipline and a good a, a good work ethic mm -hmm. and I think if you've got a good work ethic Mm. You'll be a good worker on a building site, but you'll also be a good worker in a gymnasium, won't you? So in terms of the fitness then and the bodybuilding, obviously you do very well in that. Uh, you become, I think, is it British champion? You become yeah. bodybuilding. How did that then transition to maybe seeing a gap in the market or seeing an opportunity for supplements that well, would aid the athlete? My, my bodybuilding days, I, I went to the gym at 14, 15 with Ted Fowler, um, Brian, Brian uh, Harrison, met met good friends, Alf Wenman, Frank Ogden, good, good people. I still see them now. Um, but I slipped off the discipline of training when I ended up, uh, in those days, men like my dad were very strong, hard men. And corporal punishment was just absolute normal you know a backhander was normal non-stop and it was expected you know what I mean and I ended up um falling out with my dad when I was 16 17 18, and I was homeless so I went I got a train down to Newquay in Cornwall and ended up washing dishes uh, in hotels and I did that for about six years and there was no gymnasiums at all in UK. There was not a single gymnasium in UK. So me, the training side of me uh, ended up um, on the wayside because there just, there just wasn't a gymnasium. There was not a gymnasium. I, saw, I used to do a bit of running on the beach and stuff like that. So the discipline of that just went out the window. So I came, I, I met a lady in UK, Sue, who I married. Now, you're looking at me funny because you think my wife's called Jan. <laughs> I'm thinking, I know Jan. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. It's a tragic story, to be honest. It's a tragic story because I'm the most happily married man on the planet, as mm. you know. But Sue got killed by a drunken driver. Wow. Uh, my first wife. We thought we'd, we'd only been married nine months. We'd only been married nine months. So um, Sue, we was washing dishes in UK, living together. And um, Sue said, my mum's not happy that I'm living with a man. And I said, she says, because we're not married. So I said, well, let's get married then. So we, we, we went up to Manchester and got married. Sue's mum and dad was there. My mum and dad was there because I'd made up with my dad, but I, mm. we, we couldn't live under the same roof. That's the best way to put it. And um, we, we, we bought a house in Cheadle and I went back to the building site routine uh, as an electrician. I'm a tradesman by now. So even though I was working in UK washing dishes, in them days, all you had to be was an apprentice for five years and you got your Sparks card. So I told them, I'd, you know, yeah, I fiddled it, if I'm being honest with you. Um, so, I, um, so we got married and then one day we were going to a party at a friend of mine, Alf Wenman's house. And um, we never made the party. A, a, an Iranian man had been in the country four days. He admitted in court that he drank a bottle of whiskey before he left the house. And he was driving a, an American car. Um, and he was driving, he was at Lane West. And I was on a left-hand bend on the correct side of the road in a Morris Minor. And he, he the police estimated he hit, he hit me at 60 mile an hour head on. So, um, and it killed Sue outright. And we, we uh, I, they, 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 they had to cut me out of the car and all sorts of terrible things. Um, and I, I really badly, it damaged my back. I really right, okay. badly, badly damaged my back, which I've had to live with ever mm. since. I've had three major surgeries uh, over the years. Um, and so um, I had a lot of damage with my back. So that then... Um, I struggled with training mm. then. But in them days when Sue was alive, 
um, for that nine months, I ended up doing karate as opposed to bodybuilding. Right, okay. Um, and when Sue died, I, I kept me disciplined in karate. So Was that hard? Was that difficult, obviously, after losing your wife to, the, to keep that discipline? Well, or was it, 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 it kind it's, of... It's, it's, uh, it's very, very strange. And, and I've, been, I've done podcasts where Jan, my wife, has been sat there and I'm talking about Sue. But Jan doesn't mind at all for obvious reasons. And of course it's hard. It's still hard. But you know and I know I'm the most happily married man on the planet to Jan. And yet I had to lose a wife to get that, which is a strange scenario, isn't it? You know what I mean? Mm. And Sue, Jan being Jan, yeah, because you, you know Jan inside out. She's the most beautiful w woman on the planet. Uh, when me and Jan got together... And we had our first baby, Debbie. Within four days, we drove to Sue's mum's house and um, showed her the baby. Oh, Fill yeah. it up. So, um, so it's always been we've all stuck together. In you know what I mean. Mm. So, so that was it. But I was doing karate in them days. Uh, I'd, I'd moved from lifting weights to karate and I ended up getting my black belt at Shotokan Karate. But I also knew that I couldn't carry on because, as you know, because you, you, you've you been around fighters all your life, um, in karate, it's the twist of the hips. It's it's the it's the kicking and all that. And I just couldn't do it with my lower back. My lower back was killing me. And if, if you've got a black belt around your, back, around your waist... You can't say to the sensei, I can't do that, it hurts. You know what I mean? So I had to stop doing karate. And then I went back to the to the weightlifting gym because in the weightlifting gym, there are certain exercises that you should do, but you can get away with not doing them if you know what you're doing because you can do exercises that don't aggravate your back. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, my bodybuilding career was uh, secondary to, to my... Um, uh, karate career. Did you enjoy competing either in karate or in um, weightlifting? You know, yes, I, I enjoyed the end product. I'm not, I enjoy the journey just as much as getting there. Mm. So if you're lifting weights or you're doing karate and you've got an end goal of competing, mm. it makes the journey a lot easier, doesn't mm. it? If you've got a goal, if you if you go in any, you know I work closely with boxers, if you go in any boxing gym and a boxer's got a date, you'll see that they train a lot harder than if they haven't got a date. So the journey's a lot easier if you've got a date to compete. Now, should we delve into your family tree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry laughs. Stanley, your dad, um, was born in, in 1916. The reason that I was able to trace him, and by the way, on this tree, folks, if you tune in every week, we did not use DNA, right? So this was before DNA was a thing. I know a lot of people now take ancestry DNA tests. I talk about DNA all the time and how we trace people. We didn't use it. We just relied on paper records. But the good thing was, with your dad, even though his name was Stanley, he had a rather unusual middle name, which was, which was Kitchener. Kitchener. Yeah. And that, that, apparently, that was lot named after Lord Kitchener. I was going to ask that. Where did that come apparently. from? Right, okay. So he was born in 1916 in Canada. Yeah. So that was the first shocker for me, because I was like, Canada? What was he doing in Canada? Now, when I looked into his life, and I've got um, I've got his birth certificate, I brought it with me, and I don't think I've showed you this, but I've got a picture of where they lived. Do you want to see it? Yes, please. Let's have a look. So this is Roden Place in Canada, and this is where your grandparents lived when your dad was born. God, did it look like God? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. How would you describe it, Kerry? Row of terraced houses like yeah. garden. Yeah. Row of terraced houses like garden. For our American listeners, if if ever, if if you guys listen, or sorry, if you guys watch Coronation Street, it looks like the back of Coronation Street, doesn't yeah. it? A row of terraces with the yard at the back, and you've got some washing line up. Um, if you're watching it on YouTube, I'll I'll put this picture on YouTube. So when. He was born, they lived uh, in, in Roden Place in, in Canada. So, sorry to be where well, was Roden Place? 
he was actually born in the county of York, which is in Toronto. Toronto. So he was born in, in Toronto. Then the next record that I found your dad on was coming back over to the UK. And that's his, he's on a ship and he's coming back over with his mum. And they're coming to Liverpool in 1919. But they don't stay in Liverpool. They go on to the Isle of Man. Do you remember that? Did you know you had an Isle of Man connection? No, no. When your dad is coming back over to this country and he's with his mum and his, his siblings, your granddad isn't there and your granddad Joseph isn't on that record and that's because he's in the Canadian Army and I'm presuming at that point in time, I know it's 1919, he's, he's probably First still, World War. yeah, First World War, yeah. Yeah, was the, was the Canadians involved in the First World War? So he was part of the Canadian Overseas Expeditionary Force. Right, wow, so they was in something. Your dad comes over uh, back into this country and I found the family on the 1920, 1921 census and they are living in the Isle of Man. But your dad's mum, Rose, is missing and that's because she'd passed away. And how old was my dad then? Four. Wow. Four. Now, I don't know why, but then your dad and his dad, your granddad, moved to Manchester. And I don't know why they moved to Manchester. I don't know where they, ever, where they ever said, but at the beginning of the 1920s, they moved to Manchester. Does that seem to fit with what you knew? I knew nothing. The only, on my children's life, may, maybe they did, by the way, sorry, maybe they did, and I've forgotten, but I doubt it. There was no talk in the in my household, my, my mum and dad's household, yeah. of the past. There never mm. was. I'm, I'm guessing one of the reasons I found out when you when you when you dropped the bombshell. But um, I I don't ever remember a, a, any talk of the past mm. on my dad's side. I remember my mum's side because the school holidays we used to go back to Galway which everyone did and stay at me grandma's house you know what i mean and it was it was you couldn't fit in <laughs> yeah you couldn't fit in yeah it. yeah so you so i know that in in the 1920s for whatever reason your dad and your granddad and the siblings moved to manchester i know that because in 1927 your granddad passes away and his occupation at the time is a motor car mechanic really Something that I think you wanted to be yeah. at one point. God. And guess what he died of? Go on. A bad back. Stop it. Wow. So he died of an injury to the spine that he received during the war. My God. I can see some That's parallels. That. Yeah. That. He is a, a motor mechanic. He's also getting an army pension from, from Canada. And at the time of his death, they're living on Greengate, which is in Salford. What threw me when I looked at his death certificate of your granddad was that there was an Alice case. And then when I did a bit of digging, that was his second wife. So after his first wife died, he then went on and married an Alice case in, in Manchester. Right. So your dad, in theory, had like a stepmom. Yeah. Which must, which made sense to me because... By the time your dad's 11, he's lost his mum and his dad. Wow. And I couldn't figure out who else in Manchester he was living with, you know, because at 11, who, who are you going to live with? So I'm presuming that the kids stayed with the stepmom, which which was Alice. Obviously then, I, I wanted to know a bit more about your dad when he, he got to, you know, past his teenage, past his teenage years. And in 1939, I found your dad just before World War II and he's living on Clarion Street, and he's working as a railway porter. But he's not married to your mum at this point. And this is kind of what threw me, because we didn't know this, did we? We had no idea that he'd been married before. And more importantly, Kerry, you had no idea that you had two half-sisters. None. What was that like when I told you that? Well, we, we were, I think we were all shy. You didn't know how to tell me, did you? You was, no. uh, you didn't know how to. But for your viewers, I don't, I don't know whether you, but some of your viewers, my mum, Bridie, 
was a devout Roman Catholic. She, she, she in the Catholic faith, you, you've got to go to church every Sunday. My mum went every day. Now, in the Roman Catholic faith, you cannot get married if you've been divorced. So clearly my dad knew that and didn't tell my mum. So that's why none of us knew. So it must have been a very, very dark secret. So um, none of us knew. My sister didn't know. Um, thank God my mum never found out. Thank God my mum never found out, God rest her soul. Um, because he, he wouldn't have been allowed to... My mum would not have married him. No. And you wouldn't have been here. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Thank God he's a good liar. <laughs> oh, God. So, your dad was obviously married and had these two, two half-sisters of yours. Yeah. Then my mission was to try and find out, wasn't it, what happens to these two half-sisters? It became pretty clear when I was doing the research that these half-sisters were not in Manchester. And what I did, I found that, that, that their mother, his first wife, a lady called Mary Ann Hamilton, had remarried. And when she, after she remarried, they all moved to Canada. Again, we've got this Canadian right, connection. Right, right. So, the, so my sisters were born in England? So they were born in England, right. but then moved to Canada, which is where we tracked them down to. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember you tracked them down in Canada, but I didn't. I didn't know the timeline. Did it make you think any different of your dad when you found out he'd had this like other life before your mum? No, honest to God, it didn't. Because unfortunately, my dad was the distant past. You know, my dad died a, a, a long, long time ago. Um. I hate to say we were never that close, but I don't believe families were as close as they are today. It was hard times, hard times, you know. Uh, my mum was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful human being. And she and my dad was just a real hard case. And I remember, and I shouldn't say this because it sounds as if I'm disrespecting him, but I'm not. I promise you I'm not because it was normal. I can remember my, my dad taking his belt off to, to beat us. And I can't see what possible I'd done wrong. I can't see how I could take my belt off to my son. And I can't think what he could possibly do wrong for, to warrant that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, But it was normal. Mm. It was normal. So... When you came out with those rev rev revelations, mm. I couldn't get it out then. It was, it was just well, that's my dad. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that's my dad. You know what I mean? Do you think losing his mum and dad at such a young age to lose them both by the time you were eleven? Do you think that affected maybe the way he was then with you? Because maybe well, it, you know, I don't know that I don't read they reflected the way he was with me. But the reality is it must have been horrific for him because I can't see there being the support system there is today. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. So it must have been almost Oliver Twist days, mustn't it, if you think yeah. about it. It must have yeah. been it must have been horrific. You know. No I always sorry to be rude. I, I, I always I always remember my dad thinking I was a softie. And you know some very strong men. And I think strong men can be very strong and can be very sensitive. They they live in two emotions, don't they? And I'm very sensitive. I Two, three times a week, I'll cry. I, I really do. I'm a very sensitive person. And my dad, as all men in them days, misunderstood that for you, for you being softy. You know what I mean? And you know a lot of strong men are very sensitive. You know what I mean? So I think my dad always... Yeah, I've got to. I'm going to say. I think my dad was always disappointed with me. That's that's the impression my memory gets. That's the impression mm. my memory gets. I think if he was here now, looking at your life, I don't think he'd be disappointed in you. No, and and if there was a time machine, I'd love to show my mum and dad what I've achieved. Mm. But I'd love to show the teachers at school what I achieved. <laughs> yeah, <as well>. yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, your granddad, Joseph. Uh, your dad's dad, if, if we just stay with that a minute, he was born in Boston, in Massachusetts. Wow. In 1891. 
And Rick, Ricky's first ever fight. Yeah, Ricky Hatton. Yeah. Collapso. Were you there then for that one, Kerry? Yeah, I was in the corner. Yeah. Were in you? The corner. I was in the corner. Now, during your granddad's lifetime, he would live in Boston, London, Glasgow, Barrow in Cumbria, the Isle of Man, and Salford. God, was he was the was the a traveller in him? Was the a gypsy in him? Do you think? I have no idea, but he moved around a lot. And when I looked at his um, military record, to what you know for what he did for a job, especially when he lived in Canada, it looks like that he was like a truck driver. When I say trucks, I mean that very loosely speaking. Um, the definition today is trucks. Back then, it would have been like carts. You know, yeah, yeah, like a horse Lor and cart. Lor type. Called, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, horse and cart. Well, type. either either that or he was a villain, and he kept having to go on the move. Well, I wasn't quite sure whether he was on the run. <laughs> That's I, what I mean. I thought this makes an interesting story. I mean, I couldn't find that he was on the run, but let me tell you, he moved around a wow. lot, a lot. Now, his parents, his dad John was a blacksmith from Northern Ireland, and his mum was also from Northern Ireland. She was from Antrim. Wow. Um, in 1891, when I find your granddad Joseph, he's living with his parents just off the main high street in the Isle of Man. So there's definitely this sort of Isle of Man connection in, in your side of the tree. Now, in 1903, your granddad Joseph marries Rosanna Gibbs uh, in London. And the Gibbs side of your tree are all from London. And it's in 1911 that your grandparents leave the UK for Canada to basically start start a new life. I've got a picture of where your great grandparents lived in London. If you want to yeah, see please. it, please. So this is Collingwood Street, which is where they lived. God, it's the same thing again. It terraced houses, except the street was narrower because there was no yeah. vehicles. Now you're looking at them houses. I can tell you that. Your family actually lived, some of these were three stories and they just lived on a floor wow. in one of those houses. So there'd been a family in the basement, a family as you walk through the door and then a family on the first floor. He was a shoemaker. And if we go back a step further, so, you, so that's your great granddad's a shoemaker. If we go back even further on that side, he was a provision dealer. What I always found interesting though about your tree is how much they moved and how... You're not really from one place. Yeah, there's the Isle of Man in there. But as I mentioned, you know, your tree <laughs> stretches far and wide. On both sides, we end up back in Ireland. Um, and I know you've spoken about Ireland and, and the connection you've got with Ireland. Um, were you surprised, Kerry, when we started looking into it, how many different places your family lived? Because I'm sat next to you and I know there's probably nowhere... Uh, or there's very few places that you have not travelled with with your different professions over the years. Well, yeah, yeah. I watched a film, you know. Uh, I was talking to Jan um, about, I don't know, something. And I've got some very, very old friends. We go back to 13 and 14. In fact, mm. one of them just phoned me up on the way here. And they've never left where they're from. And... I, w I went to New Key. I've been mm. all over the show, and I watched a film the other day, and they were talking. They were somebody was philosophizing in the film, and they said there's basically two types of people: those that stay round the campfire, and those that wander off. You understand what I mean? Mm. And I said to Jan, you know, you think about that, and I mentioned three or four, five, six mates. I said they've stayed round the campfire, don't they, love? And we wandered off. And I guess my family was the type who wandered away from the campfire. Kerry, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. Honestly, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I know the hour is nearly up, but I could literally, I wish I'd have booked two hours because you tell some of the best stories <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. Your family tree was honestly brilliant. And to find your two half sisters, who I know that at the time we did reach out to, didn't we? We did make contact. We reached out with, to one of their daughters, I think. I know one of your sisters was unfortunately uh, in a home, wasn't she, at the time. And then I think we spoke to the daughter of, of the other sister. Um, but we did that without DNA, it was just, just paper records. So well, if you we, can't we, afford a DNA yeah. test, I was just gonna say, you know, and the paper records are there, you can do this kind of mm. research. 
I didn't think it would have been healthy to go and visit them, though. I never did. I was going to say, did you ever feel like having a relationship with them? No, no, the the reason being, when you told me, I was probably, well, I'm 74 in April, so I would have been 65, which means they would have been at least 75. And I think I found out about them because it was a past, but it would have been strange for me to walk into their lives. Mm. I don't think it was worth it. Plus, I probably would have ended up paying the bill for the old homes, for the four homes. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> paying for the nursing homes. <laughs> Kerry Kays, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So that is it then for this week's podcast. A huge thank you to the legend that is Kerry Kays for coming on and speaking to me about his family tree, and in particular talking about finding his two half sisters. Thank you so much, as always, for listening. You know, I couldn't make this podcast without you. I literally couldn't. Um, And a huge thank you to this week's sponsor as well, the lovely Whitney Antiques. Thank you so much for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. So as I always say every week, have a really good week researching, folks. Keep your comments coming in. Keep sending me messages. Uh, I must apologise because I've not actually got through last week's messages, but I'm going to try and do it um, over the next couple of days. So if you've reached out to me, um, I will get back to you, I promise. Don't forget, I do put these podcasts on YouTube. It's normally a few days after the podcast has been released, so keep checking out my YouTube channel, which is just on Earth the Past um, podcast. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I shall see you again next week. Take care.